email from them is very difficult. I mean, normal gets you know so much email every day and so many from people that have been arrested. And one of the things I, I'm, by the way, that reminds me, I have something to plug here. I do marijuananews.com, as a lot of people know, but I am uh, in the process of starting up a new uh, website called the victimfiles.com. And the victim files is no. basically going to be letters, emails from people telling their own story. And normal gets. Uh, quite a number every day, and I get others, and so on. Uh -huh. So I uh, hope within the, uh, the month of, of June to get the, the victim files started, and just basically. St uh, you know, will that story. will it be the victim files dot com? Mm -hmm. Then yeah, the victim files dot com. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the victim files one word, and that's uh, the idea. Is just I said the header on it just to say that marijuana prohibition is not a victimless crime. That marijuana prohibition is wrecking people's lives. And I think one of the most interesting aspects of the way uh, the, these stories is that we obviously think of, of people, you know, like my friend Todd McCormick, who's in the federal pen, or other people that are in, the, in, in jail, as being the victims, as certainly they are. But there are a lot of people who have been victimized by prohibition who have never been arrested. Uh, in some ways, they are. Uh, suffering more than even the people in jail. If you think about people who uh, have suffered for years with uh, diseases that uh, the symptoms could be alleviated by medical cannabis, uh, people who die, who go blind because they can't get it or are afraid to or, or don't know about it, or even more absurdly, who uh, say, well, I've heard that, but I'm not going to try it because it's against the law. And they are proud of being law-abiding citizens in a country ruled by people who do not obey the law themselves. And the idea that people would suffer that much, and sometimes suffer terribly, as I say, die and go blind, or whatever, and yet you know, they are doing this because they take pride in being you know, law-abiding citizens in a country that is ruled by people who put themselves above the law. And that's what those people are certainly victims as much as anybody who's ever been arrested. Perhaps I'd say more so. Maybe, it'll, maybe they're in prisons of their own making because they have bought into the mm -hmm. uh, uh, reefer madness propaganda. Yeah, Richard, would, I'm just wondering, would you mind going back to where you were just uh, a few minutes ago? Uh, you know, back to where you first got involved with normal. I mean, uh, one thing I have to mention is is that uh, it seems like a, a not unusual thing that uh, people who over the years have really been activists and really tried to make uh, changes in society for for the better. I mean, they're either dead, shot, in jail, or just totally burnt out. And uh, and it seems to me like you're really pretty optimistic and. Uh, and uh, and moving along in a in a like a breath of fresh air or something, you know, to me. And and yet you spent all of these years back in the U.S. Uh, would you tell us a little bit more about uh, you know what happened when you got into normal and and what kind of forces? I mean, uh, I can remember Jimmy Carter was talking about uh, legalizing marijuana back when he was president. Uh, uh, I think that many millions of people just th thought that it was just going to happen any second. And, and then it's not, not only did we go backwards, it's like uh, we've gone into the dark ages and, and, and it's so f screwed up right now where all of our attention, our national attention, instead of being on real terrorists and real criminals, the attention of our government is on uh, persecuting uh, marijuana smokers which 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 incidentally is obviously preferable to tobacco or to uh, alcohol I mean uh, f for, for you know well I, I, let's get back to your experience you know what you know when you first got in there and you started you know you wanted to to make some changes and to bring people together I mean well I, I, you know, I think there are days when I have burnout uh, or sometimes more than days but I think that, again, so long as I have friends in pain and friends in prison, I can't quit. I cannot quit. I don't have that. I, I, I'm, uh, I'm really driven by what Jesus said, that to whom much is given, much is required. And 
so much has been given to me in my life uh, that I feel a profound sense of obligation, particularly to my friends who have been so badly hurt by this. And also that I, you know, I think occasionally we get some licks in where we, you know, where we know that we're making a difference. And I uh, have had times in my life when I know that I have made a difference in, in, in getting laws changed and doing things. And uh, it, uh, it, that is the sort of thing that keeps, that keeps me going. If you're talking back back in during the 70s, uh, when we thought we'd, we had won, is a very important point because I talked to my Canadian friends about the what I call the prohibitionist counterattack going on here in Canada, and you can never assume uh, that you have won until you have won, and this is uh, we are we are not there yet. And during the 1970s, b before. Uh, as you say before uh, uh, Nixon, Jimmy Carter made a man named Peter Benzinger the uh, head of the DEA, and I've debated, as it turns out, Benzinger several times. Ironically, he was at Yale just a few years before I was. So this is uh, you know something that we have to you know, be aware of because just because we think we're close in some places doesn't mean that the prohibitionists can't counterattack. And, and they are, and they have such vast resources. And they're, to put it very bluntly, and I said this before, there is no lie that they will not tell, and there is no crime that they will not commit up to and including murder. And that is something that, uh, that you know, we have to be constantly aware of because until we have won, we cannot rest. And we are close in. Uh, in some parts of the world, and we're getting closer in Canada, but until it's over with, it ain't over. And what happened? What happened in America, though? I mean, what? Do you, I mean, do you have any? Well, that's a good question. I, you know, I mean, first off, uh, you could see this happening in the '70s uh, when uh, the prohibitionist counterattack began. Nobody took it seriously because the base of it was in the Senate Internal Security Subcommittee headed by the I late think. James O. Eastland, who was one of the most vicious, stupid, bigoted racists who ever disgraced the United States Senate. And uh, Eastland would say things, you know, well, first off, the justification for it was that marijuana was a threat to the internal security of the United States, and we were going to be raising a generation of zombies, that was his phrase, and so that they were going to save America from marijuana. And this, of course, came after the, the Schaefer Commission, which Nixon authorized and repudiated as soon as he got its results, had said that marijuana should be decriminalized. Isn't that outrageous, though? I mean, that that happened? Well, of course, one of the most interesting things that's come out of late is the, the uh, Nixon uh, tapes that show uh, how <laughs> really deranged this man was. I mean, I, uh, there, there's no other word for it. I mean, that, you know, he, he really thought that, that marijuana prohibition was some sort of cult uh, or plot by, by Jewish psychiatrists. Uh, that, uh, of course, and it, I mean, it was, you know, the, the Jews are every place type thing. And this was a kind of wing nut, again, that was president of the United States and suppressed you know, his own study that showed that uh, the cannabis prohibition was, you know, was, was not working as unjust. So <laughs> it's uh, a sad history, oh, it's, isn't it? It's 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 bizarre. <laughs> it really is. And when you read these things, oh you, God, you, you, the, these transcripts <laughs> of these tapes, uh, it gives you an idea of how truly awful that this is. You know, you know and and where where it comes from, and the origins of cannabis prohibition, by the way, in Canada are. Uh, uh, cannabis prohibition in Canada began before it did the United States, and it was a product of racist books by uh, the, one of the leading Canadian feminists, uh, Emily uh, Murphy, who is, uh, uh, was the first in, uh, woman judge in the British Empire, and is, in his, uh, there's a statue of her on uh, Parliament Hill and with, a, with four of the women uh, in Ottawa. And yet, this is a woman who uh, wrote vicious, racist tracts about uh, the Chinese and the blacks and so on, and using uh, cannabis, of course, to, as I recall, to seduce young white virgins, um, which uh, there are still a few left. 
here. But uh, that, that's, you know, the, the fact of the matter is when you look into the origins of, of prohibition and